of City County coming up on the 20th, or are they not going to do it this month? So I think they're off two months. Okay. Yeah, but just I will let me know. I will follow up just to make sure. <coughs> Where's Harold tonight? He's right here at the airport. No. At the airport. He will be. Momentarily. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Board of Education meeting this November 11th, 2019. Uh, we will go ahead and call this meeting to order with six board members present. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. That passes 6-0. On to consent agenda. Dr. Cobbs, anything special on here tonight? Normal stuff on there this month. All right. I make a motion we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. And that also passes 6-0. Uh, we do not have any comments from the public this evening. Um, so we'll move on to reports and presentations. Uh, we have uh, students from Night at the Lab who are going to uh, present to us tonight. Welcome. Have a sticker. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Two types of restrictive lung disease. 
second is extrinsic, some examples being scoliosis, obesity, and pleural effusion. As you can imagine, these are straightforward diseases of our attachment to exercise, thus overall impacting the lung capacity. Amazing. A little bit of um, back information on that. This is the first year that Ottawa High School we've ever um, done the competition at Night Lab. It is sponsored by KU. And these three students stepped up, even as underclassmen, they stepped up. And a um, little bit of information about that is uh, because they are so involved in all of the extracurricular activities, they met every morning with me at 6.15. Um, for three weeks straight and then we went to the regional competition at the end of October and they blew everyone out of the water it was amazing so and we competed against schools such as Blue Valley um, all of the Olathe district uh, Shawnee Mission I mean they were the they were the big schools and they really did well we were very proud of them so they will present again um, next Monday and Tuesday at KU Medical at Ra on Rainbow Boulevard, and they're going to compete against the six, uh, well, five other regional winners across the state of Kansas, and hopefully they'll bring home a title. Wow. Yeah, so please, any questions, it just helps them prepare. So <laughs> give them hard ones. <laughs> hey, I think that's fantastic. Um, what a great rep representation of what our students are doing in the schools today. So congratulations. What type of research did you do? Was it quantitative? Qualitative? Uh, well, <laughs> we have a book of our research textbook right okay. here. It's okay. all labeled and, uh, yeah, it's just a book of resources. I mean, okay. mainly researched online, um, different studies of different universities and things like that. Mm -hmm. So are these, like, approved websites because a lot of stuff is on the Did you do any primary interviews with doctors or pulmonologists or anything like that? So win anyway, even if he doesn't like you. Yeah. yeah. Gotta watch him too. Ah, oh, very good. Good job. Well done. Well done. Yeah, Thank well you so done. much. Good Thanks job, for guys. sharing that with us. Good information. I know a lot more about lung capacity than I do. Uh, and thank you, Mrs. Steinbaugh, for taking yes. this project thank on. You. And You're welcome. It's really very interesting. It's very fun. I like it. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Thanks. All right, um, we are moving on to section 5.02, which is the OPA presentation. Um, Ms. Harrell is going to provide an update on the services and programs. Jody, do you have a neat display like that? Can you <laughs> no? <laughs> um, this one or this one? You go to the first. Right now, I just want to kind of give you an idea of our menus that we, are do, we do on a monthly basis. <coughs> we um, serve <coughs> four breakfast options for all grade levels. Um, at the grade school level for lunch, we are serving four items. And at the middle school, we give them six choices. Three of those are the open to goes, which is easy just to grab and go on. And then the other three are the hot entree items. We do 14 different items at the high school level to give them lots of different opportunities. Some of the things that we have tried this year that are new are the Italian flatbread, 
that's went over really well. Um, we've also done a buffalo macaroni and cheese and a pork enchilada. And we do these meetings with the children twice a year, state requires it, and it's kind of nice to get to know the kids. And we ask them, what would you like to see on the menu? What would you like to have? One of the big things last year was strawberry milk. So we did bring that back this year, and that's helped a lot. Um, Oh, in the first nine weeks this year, we have served 21,382 breakfasts. For lunch, we have done 56,136. Year to date, our participation at Garfield is 46 above last year. Our high school is by, behind by 51. It's a lot of that was the one hour lunch that they are doing we are working on ideas to get the lunch participation up there but it's better than what started out we were down a hundred so we're gradually moving up on that Lincoln we are flat even middle school we are up 22 this year versus last year and sunflower we're down 32 a lot of that I think a lot of kids have went from sunflower to Garfield but and that is what we have done so far this year so part of the reason that we had uh, Jody and Dee here tonight is that as we were developing the handbook, it was mentioned that you would like to see multiple reports from, from OPA throughout the year, not just the end of the year report, um, as to what we're seeing with our kids, what the menus look like. I think you know, when, you, when you start thinking about between breakfast and lunch, when we had 70, some almost 80,000 some odd meals served, you start talking of the the capacity that must exist within the within the kitchens remember that all of those things are made in the high school and distributed out to the other schools it's a fairly significant undertaking and one that should not be um, underappreciated uh, for for the work that you all do i think it's also important to um, to recognize that the high school there are 14 different menu items for them to choose from I don't know how many homes give their kids the choice between 14 different menu items, but it's very few, I would imagine. Uh, but OPA does a great job of, of trying to provide something um, to, uh, to finicky kids that like what they like and don't like what they don't like. And uh, I'm glad that they did say that they enjoy strawberry milk and that we've been able to bring strawberry milk back. It's a wonderful thing. <coughs> But we do appreciate what, what OPA does each and every day, and, and um, thank you for coming in and thank bringing you. it. And if our board has any questions for you. What's the correlation between the open hour at the high school and, and the, the minus 51 kids eating lunch? What's that? How does that correlate? They are learning um, to manage their time. And right now, like a lot of the kids at the beginning, they all come in at once and then kids didn't want to wait in line so then they didn't come and now they're learning how to manage their time and so they're coming later because we have that whole hour and we serve food the whole continue hour and uh, so they had a to come in later they just needed to learn to adjust they were afraid that they were going to miss out or whatever so they ran in there and we've been fixing it having time enough to fix more if they needed or whatever and so that's why i think it's picking back up because they're learning to schedule their time Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Harrell? No? Jody and Dee, thank you. Thank Appreciate you, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right, we are moving down to section 5.03. Um, Dr. Cobbs is going to present the Cognia Values Driven Award. All right, so there you can see uh, in front of my spot there at the desk is the uh, Cognia Values Driven Award. Um, Mr. Robinson and Ms. Spivey and I went to Chicago a couple of weeks ago um, to accept this award on behalf of Cognia, which is a Midwest accreditation system for us, um, but also a um, not only a nationwide but universally around the world utilized over 40,000 accreditation systems. Uh, throughout the throughout the world this is the press release that was released um, regarding our our award um, 
but it's talking about challenging factors. And ultimately what it gets to is that, um, that they are impressed. Cognia overall as a system is impressed with our innovation um, and that we are beginning to break down barriers to student achievement and, in, and making sure that our system is student-centric and being able to move past the normalcy of school and into something different to ensure that each and every one of our students has a personalized learning uh, platform that really provides um, beneficial learning experiences for them. Um, we've been talking about how the redesign process has begun to impact our schools and we're, we're just now kind of seeing the benefits to that. Certainly KSDE and, and uh, the Kansas State Department of Education and Kansas Association of School Boards is recognizing how that impact is influencing not only our school but schools in our area. I think this is a direct result of not only being recognized here but also being recognized throughout the Midwest as a school that is really beginning to change the focus from a more adult-centric system to a student-centric system that is really going to empower students to learn um, in the areas where they're excited about learning while still meeting all the expectations of the state in terms of uh, state standards and ensuring college and career readiness for, for all students. So it's the Cogni Award, um, really exciting stuff. Uh, and and we, were, um, we were blessed to have the opportunity to go and be the recipients of the award. But I think it does speak volumes to our board, and, and we really wanted to share it tonight in appreciation of our school board for giving um, our teachers and our staff the latitude to try some different things for the benefit of our students and ultimately reap those benefits as we're beginning to do. So thank you all very much. I have questions if you have them. Are you going to build a trophy case now that we've got? You know, I've always been kind of disappointed that all of those um, awards and, and whatnot have been sitting down here when the vast majority of the people come into the front of the building. So I think we will put something together where people can come into the front of the building and, and see the recognitions that our district has been provided because of the great staff and the incredible things that our kids are doing. And when we see our kids put on a presentation like that tonight, um, and you see what Mrs. Steinbaugh is doing with our kids and, and the, the value um, that comes with teachers that show up at six o'clock and probably for her more like five o'clock in the morning um, to work with our students to help prepare them to be able to participate, not only participate, but then win yeah. um, competitions like this and be able to go and represent our school district. It's a, it's a, a pretty, awe-inspiring um, situation to be in as the superintendent and watch that unfold each and every day we know there's a lot of hard work that goes into it on everyone's part absolutely we do appreciate absolutely. it our kids and community are better off for it so any questions, questions? for dr cobbs okay thank you thank you <coughs> curriculum update you get most handouts yes I got the award for most handouts but we're not going to look at every single one of them tonight that was for your benefit to be able to see the work that we've been doing uh, I would also like to echo Dr. Cobb's um, thank you to you for allowing us to do conferences like we've been able to do um, you know when you go outside of your district you really realize how amazing our teachers are the things that they're doing within our district um, how amazing you are as a board that you support the, thi the things that we are trying to do. Uh, the last two conferences we've been at, the PLC conference this summer as administrators and this one, just reaffirms that the things that we're doing, we're above or ahead of what a lot of districts are trying to do. So uh, it's, it's pretty exciting and we have to be able to, you know, thank our, our, uh, everyone involved, our teachers, our um, students, our parents, uh, the administrative staff, everybody working together to be able to do what's best. And honestly, you guys did an amazing job. Very, very proud to see kids get up and do, and not only prepare everything that they prepared, but to be able to speak and present themselves the way they did. That's pretty amazing, and you guys should be very proud of yourselves. Okay, so curriculum update. We have lots going on. And there we go. Give up control. Okay, the, I'm going to start with our math because this year is a math uh, curriculum adoption year where we 
typically do a study year before we even look at um, per purchasing possible new resources. We started this last February. Uh, what we wanted to do was um, we, we needed to change the process in how we went about looking at curriculum adoption review in that we needed to turn our focus back to the instruction and not be just about the resources. So our, the very first thing that our cadre did was came up with a math vision that of what math should look like in USD 290. Um, all of the, the visuals they actually also came up with so that there is representation of the things that we would expect for our kids to, for our instruction to look like in our classroom and the kids that, uh, the things that we want our kids to be learning in math. And some of the key words in this vision statement is that we have teachers providing purposeful, interactive, and engaging lessons because we need our kids to be critical thinkers, be problem solvers, to be able to look at problems and not just go through a process of, of computation, but to really have that mindset um, to work collaboratively to figure out problems that are related to math. So that has been our, the state has um, developed new mathematical practices that were um, introduced, that were approved in 2017. And so that's where our instruction needs to change is making sure that our math instruction has includes those mathematical practices. So we went through a process. We have the different phases are the phases that are the um, kind of the steps of going through a curriculum adoption process. And we are currently on phase three. So it's not a quick process. It's really something that we're valuing and taking um, our time to make sure that we are really understanding the standards that we're expecting to teach so that when we're looking at resources, we're making sure we're choosing the best resources that are available um, that will cover the things that we need to have covered in math. The, the shift in the process is our math team is much larger than it has been in the past. Typically, you, uh, we in the past, we've just had representation from um, each level, not so much even having secondary and elementary together, sometimes was separate. Uh, and that, but we this 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 year or last starting last year, we have representation from every elementary building, uh, the entire middle school and high school math departments. So the conversations that we have had have been very that the teachers have found it to be very valuable because they're having vertical conversations, not just within elementary or their grade level or secondary and their department, but we're having conversations K-12. And they very much found those um, oh, very, very helpful and beneficial because we also, also are including um, SPED uh, teachers. We are including our gifted teacher. Um, instructional coaches. So there's a large group of people that we're working through this process. And our goal is to develop a collective understanding of what we feel like math looks, mathematics should look like in our district and then what are our resources that we have available right now. Because if our resources are okay, there's no need to get something just because we're up for a curriculum adoption. Uh, and then if, if there's something out there that's better, why is it better? And let's go through a specific process and making sure that we're picking the um, being fiscally respons responsible with what we're choosing as our materials. So that's really been a shift in the process. We, part of the process was, again, understanding what our standards are and developing a scope and sequence. So this is very small. I'm not expecting you to read all of that. Uh, but we went through a process on the back wall. You can see the papers with the uh, white pieces taped to it or glued tape, I guess, taped to it. Our teachers actually went through, this math team went through the process of cutting up every single standard that they're expected to teach. Looking at what those standards are, developing or knowing which ones are focus standards, which ones we should be spending 70% of our instruction time, 20% and 10% of our instruction time on. There is no way that with the amount of standards that our teachers have that they would be able to teach every single one of those standards to the same level. So what we look at is we look at which ones are considered our essential standards or our focus standards, and then which are, you know, we are still important, which just need to maybe be touched on. So we put those uh, in quarters, and then teachers actually looked at, okay, now let's have some conversations. They looked at these vertically, and they realized, wow, we have some things that um, maybe kids get in third grade and they don't get it again until seventh grade. Well, that's really important for our seventh grade teachers to know that because as they, um, 
have those kids then they might in seventh grade and they're working on that concept they might have to build that re, re, kind of refresh kids in what that knowledge is before just to, instead of just expecting them that well I know they've had it so we should be able to just move on so there were a lot of great conversations about where things should be moved around we got past the the thought that we should be mapping our or developing our standards um, based on the textbook that we have, but they truly were thinking about where should those math standards be taught with their mathematical knowledge versus if that's where it is in the textbook. So from that, we have this uh, scope and sequence that has not been formally um, rolled out to all of the teachers yet at this point. Uh, we're still doing some editing and revising. Uh, teachers, or the team, the last time we met, went back through it to see where are the domains, like numbers and operations. What does that look like K-12? What does geometry look like K-12? What does operations and algebraic thinking look like K-12? Went through each of those areas to see if there was any changes that needed to be made. And then we're doing some highlighting to be able to help it to be a little more user friendly for our teachers. Uh, is there any questions about the math portion before I move on to overall curriculum work? So uh, the scope and sequence, I mean, back back long ago, we would, we would choose a math series and then kind of um, um, massage the scope and sequence to fit the series that we were choosing how's that going to to change well that was the that was the piece that we had to get past because we need to be thinking about mathematically how do those um how how do those skills progress what's the progression for understanding for kids to be able to understand and for instance a lot of a lot of them thought we need to start with geometry first in the elementary where it used to be geometry was last they also noticed that a lot of measurement and data is very at the very end and doesn't have a whole lot of focus to it, yet it's tested. So there's some things there that we have to look at um, where mathematically does it make sense for our kids to have those skills. So uh, more and more resources are also um, showing that kind of following the same change of philosophy, if you will because they're saying a lot of the resources will say you don't have to follow it page one to page to the end you can move it around based on what you feel is best for your students and their understanding so so we're getting it back to our teachers really truly understanding what's the um, progression that's going to make the most sense for our kids in learning mathematics how does it build on each other any other questions Okay, we will move on to the rest of the curriculum work. So, excuse me, so all the, um, every teacher in every content area is at this point working on developing those essential standards, pretty much the same process that we went through with math, just not as, as in depth of doing the scope and sequence at this point. Um, but they have gone through the process of determining what of their standards are their essential standards. They are in the process of and should, uh, most of them should be done with what would be considered our first quarter map uh, and starting to put those into the essential standards charts. Those are things that I have shared with you in the past and I reshared those documents with you could, so you could see the um, templates that the teachers uh, are working with. <coughs> They're receiving support from their administrators, from instructional coaches, uh, myself, um, as a matter of fact, I'll be over at the high school all day tomorrow uh, where teachers can come in and I can offer support to them in what the work that they're doing with their in particular curriculum map. Uh, and this is a process that will continue all throughout the year. Our goal is to be able to have all four quarters mapped um, and then be able to from there start moving towards that we have a guaranteed and viable curriculum. That's, that's our overall vision is making that's the process that we're going through. Preschool has just started with a curriculum review. They actually have a very strong uh, resource, cre uh, creative curriculum. And so they, uh, uh, Mr. Robinson brought in some professional de 
development for them at the beginning of the year. So they actually determined what their in, the intended use of the resource that they have, and they have actually gone through with Mrs. Fanning the process of doing a scope and sequence just like this process was, where they could see where are their standards, what are the standards that, um, how did they fit within their units. Their preschool's designed a little bit differently, and they're, they're more develop, or designed in units so um, through the early learning standards. But they're going through that same process. Um, in the winter, they will take a look at, with Mr. Robinson and Mrs. Fanning, um, they will be looking at, is creative curriculum the, the uh, resource that they have right now? Is, is it doing what we need it to do for our preschoolers? Are there, uh, I know there's an updated, some updated things that they have already received as trials, um, and is there something that we need to be looking at a different resource or stick with what we have? Like I was saying, the creative curriculum that they have is still rated very high as far as effectiveness when you're looking at different types of ed reports. So because our math process, doing the scope and sequence, was so successful, we would like to try to um, go through this process with a group of teachers uh, do, for ELA and science this winter. The reason we're holding off on social studies would be because the state is at this point um, updating this social study standards. So we would want to wait to do this process until the updated standards come out next year. Um, for ELA, ELA is a big, big, it covers a lot of, of um, skills and we would like to focus on writing. And we're looking to possibly do this at one of our January um, professional development days. At least get it started. It may not get done, but at least get it started and start having conversations. The writing piece actually was brought to, um, the, the need or the want was brought by teachers. Um, some teachers went to a writing conference with, with uh, Mrs. Day and myself, and then also through the Curriculum Advisory Council. Uh, it also came up that, hey, we are in real need of, making sh of looking to see what our writing outcomes are K-12 um, and trying to have a little bit better plan for that. So that's where that um, process is coming th from or why we're doing it so quickly. Fontes and Pinnell Classroom, uh, we are, it's going uh, really well, our K-3 uh, implementation, full implementation this year. It's been great to talk with teachers. I direct you to the part on our, the PowerPoint here where um, our comments from our teachers, our students are discussing text more deeply. Um, the one, uh, I know our teachers, a couple, I've talked to a couple of different teachers, and Mrs. Day also hears a lot from teachers that they feel like they're better reading instructors, and that was what I had hoped and, and in thought by seeing what the materials are, um, but it gives them a lot of um, also leeway, or what do I want to say, flexibility to be able to um, offer reading instruction that is responsive to their students. So they're not just following, here's day one, day two, day three, but they are truly determining what lessons their students need based on um, where what their students' progress is and whatever the skills that they are working on. So um, structured literacy in Fontes and Pinnell classroom, the reason I shared that with you and I shared a document that Mrs. Day and I had created is coming down from the state. There will be mandates that we um, ensure that we have structured literacy as part of our reading instruction. So what we wanted to do was make sure we could show our <coughs> teachers and ourselves that the components that are part of structured literacy, which are listed there, um, we do find those in Fontes and Pinnell classroom. So the document that I shared with you shows exactly uh, our teachers where they can find sound symbol association or syllable instruction within their Fontes and Pinnell classroom um, components. So that it was uh, important for us to be able to make sure, first of all, make sure ourselves that, hey, we are addressing this and Fontes and Pinnell classroom does address this. So when those mandates come down from the state, we'll be hopefully ahead of the game there. Uh, at this point, the structured literacy document that I shared with you has only been presented to K2 teachers. That was just at this last professional development, so other teachers at this point have not um, seen that document. However, it's mostly uh, for the, the um, foundational um, language instruction that happens in K2, so that's why we started with those teachers. So, uh, sometimes we have to decide it's not everybody needs to know the information right at this moment because they already have enough in their, full in their brains or on their plate that they don't need, if it doesn't 
um, directly pertain to them, then we're going to hold off on sharing that information with them at this point. Any questions on those two areas? Okay, so then now fourth and fifth grade, this is their professional learning year. Uh, and it, this has, it's been a little bit slower start because our materials uh, did not come in as timely as they did last year. So our teachers uh, pretty much have, the expectation is still the same, that our teachers are encouraged to start with the context that they feel most comfortable with. Um, it, the Fountas and Pinnell Classroom recommends starting with interactive read aloud. Most of them started with guided reading just because they had those materials from the beginning, at the beginning of the year. Uh, but now that they have all of the materials, um, they're, they can start looking into that interactive read aloud. So our professional development and support uh, was, I just listed all of the things that we offer to our teachers to offer that, or to um, give them support. And others, some are jumping right in, others are taking it just step by step, and however it works for each teacher to be able to um, get into the Fountas and Pinnell classroom materials and understand that um, what it has to offer for their kids uh, is really to be developed at their pace. Doesn't mean reading instruction isn't happening. Reading instruction is happening, it, it just may not be directly with the Fountas and Pinnell classroom materials. Any questions there? Are the fourth and fifth grade teachers as ecstatic about the, the, um, the reading materials as the, the, the... I'd say some are, yes. They're, the, the texts are amazing and that's what they are just thrilled with. Um, I think there are some that are a little more overwhelmed. Um, if they're if their design of how they taught reading was not to use guided reading or to have the small groups, it may take a little more getting used to because the structure of it might be a little more different. It might be a little different. Um, there's also, honestly, I think there's a little struggle with, a, with some when they're not given, here's what you do day one, here's what you do day two, here's how much time you use, where they're having to, they're really, it develops them into be thinking back to being a thinking teacher being able to um, know where their students are and what skills they're doing well at and what skills they are struggling with and how do we address those skills within their, that, their reading instruction time. And we've also really, uh, with the support, we haven't, there's some that has been uh, um, um, not optional and there's others that we've kept it optional because we're really trying to not push them to the place where um, they are like feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't even take any more in because there's too much, I have too much on my plate. So we're trying to, to help them as much as possible. And I, like I said, the majority of teachers are just jumping in and they're, they're excited about giving it a try. Okay, last area, I believe, is our standards-based grading. And this, of course, I've spoke on before. Um, I think what I would focus on uh, at this point is that we've had our first um, parent-teacher conferences where teachers were able to um, give the first report that we had for standards-based report card. And uh, a lot of the teachers, uh, I, some of the comments actually that I heard, heard was that this was the first time I talked with my child about their learning without a focus on their grades. So that was from a parent. And then another parent said, I feel like I understand what their learning actually looks like and specifically what we need to work on. So I think those are very positive steps in the right direction. Uh, we will still continue to meet with our standards-based grading cadre so that we can look at reviewing, revising, and supporting implementation. The teachers still meet monthly to, in a district PLC to continue making sure that we are um, all on the same page as far as filling out or determining those essential standards and how we're going to uh, assess those and what it looks like on the report card, on the progress report. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but we are definitely on the track that's moving forward with it. It's pretty exciting. Just so that our board remembers, the standards-based grading piece um, comes back with a redesign initiative that was developed by our teachers about three years ago now. It's, it's been a little while. Um, but we are beginning to see that implementation move itself up 
through the through the levels. Certainly, K through pre K through five is is in this situation now. Um, but part of the conversation that's happening with the curriculum piece is that as we create that scope and sequence, the next piece with it is common assessments throughout. As we develop those common assessments, we should have a better indication of how we can implement standards-based grading across all grade levels. You will begin to see um, some pilots happening at the middle school level as our social studies department there at OMS is beginning to think about how this might look at the, at the secondary level. Certainly secondary is more problematic maybe for a lack of a better term um, because of the need for credits that are associated with the grades and GPA and, and requirements to, um, to gain admissions into a post-secondary institution and all of those things. What you are beginning to hear are region schools beginning to have a conversation and a shift to standards-based grading as well to ensure that the students coming through the college system are not just earning grades based upon point attainment, but earning grades upon, grades upon skills um, and, and knowledge defined while they're in the classroom. So a lot of those things really beginning to take shape for us. And over the course of a number of years, a lot of steps towards the final goal. And actually, it's uh, really the, the communication that happens at the high school that I have seen is really more on just effective grading practices. And how can we, uh, I know just recently, there was even uh, a conversation that was happening at the high school about what can I do if, what do I do if I have a kiddo who's still working to show their learning even though grades have been posted? So how do we go about addressing that? So those conversations are, are happening that we're not limiting ourselves to when, when gr the grade book closes, but we're really truly staying focused on what are our kids learning and how are we, they showing us that they have learned the expected standards, so. Any questions for Mrs. Bybee? Thank you. Thank All you right. so much. We always yeah. appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Amy. Great information. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Robinson will give us a SPED update. Thank you, sir. Is it mine now? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when Dr. Cobbs asked me to present tonight, I did the best I could to kind of pare it down. Um, as Amy mentioned, there's so much that we're doing, so I'll hit on um, a lot of these topics just on the surface. And if there's something you would like me to stop and go in more depth, please do, or, or I can provide uh, additional information at a later time. Um, from the time I took this job, I thought that within our district vision, uh, my main responsibility with the programs that I oversee was really that all piece. And there's, there's a balance there of making sure the students in our our specific specialized programs are getting what they need and also ensuring that uh, we're doing what's best for students um, that are, are going through the typical track and are, are navigating the school more on their own without those supports. Um, I would tell you this year I am feeling more and more confident and I'll highlight some of those places where I think we're doing an even better job of, of maintaining that balance. Um, and then there's other areas where we're always going to be uh, working on that area, but um, when we started with new teachers this year, uh, we shared this quote because uh, coming back from the PLC Institute this summer, I think Shannon and I both have taken the approach with our SPED staff um, that we, we've really got to put a focus back on instruction. So much of our special ed focus has been on uh, compliance, and that's an important piece with a real legal process like special education is. Um, but we're really trying to refocus our team on the instructional side and really look, using data um, to drive what we're doing. And it was important for us to really take a look that we all have in our head this picture of, of a student who's going to be successful in school and those students that aren't. And yet when you really dig down deep into the data, um, there's very little there to really have us, give us the ability to be able to predict that early on. Um, so we want to make sure we're providing the best we can for all students uh, within our district. So um, I tried in each, each section just to give a quick reminder of some of the things connected to the programs that we have. Um, special ed is probably the one we talk about the most. Um, most of our referrals right now, one of the things I'm proud of with our schools is most of our referrals come through our SIT process, our student improvement processes, uh, which is something we should we should highlight more often. It shows that our schools have good processes in place to provide intervention for students 
um, and and that we're you know we're getting to a point where we're providing a lot for our students before um, before we make that big referral to special education and look for those additional supports. Um, some of the reminders on the side there. Uh, one of the things that often uh, we forget is that the majority of our students in special education um, actually come at school with typical cognitive abilities. Um, there's just something that impacts them in, in being able to access school curriculum the same way as everybody else. Uh, the most common conversation we have is around those students with emotional disturbances and behavior. And yet, really, it's probably the smallest percentage of our uh, population that we provide services for. Um, our largest group is actually our, our students in speech services and those with uh, developmental dis disabilities that are in our early uh, grades. Um, again, just a reminder to the board, and I, I provide this reminder to staff as often as I can, it is a legal document. So no matter what we write into that document, <coughs> And how much I like what's written in or you like what's written in, it is something that we are um, required to provide. And that's been a piece that uh, we're seeing more and more follow through from everybody on our teams right now. So something that um, building principals have been great in supporting. And the other big piece there that I ended with, uh, we're really trying to stress the importance of providing as much as we can in the general education classroom setting um, and really focusing on the curriculum that they should get at their grade level. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, Shannon has played a big role in helping us get back to focusing on instruction. Um, when we get a request right now that we've got a student that's not making progress, uh, she is kind of our first line of defense of being able to go over and sit down with our special education teachers, helping them look at data in ways they haven't in the past, and really looking at the curriculum resources that we already have in place uh, to help those students and and um, in a lot of cases right now the special education teachers that we're getting we're getting them with few, with less training less experience in the classroom than what we've had in the past and so it's been even more important that we can provide that on the job um, training we've collaborated a lot with Amy and with Kara and it's pretty common to come into the office on any given day and for us to be kind of looking at a specific area of intervention and talking through what do we have, what are we trying to do with that, how does it connect with Fontas and Pinnell at elementary level, um, and all of those pieces are going to help ensure that alignment between what's being taught in the classroom and what we're doing on the intervention side of special education aligns so that our students aren't being taught in one way when they go into the classroom and a completely different approach um, when, when they go into a special education room or a title classroom. So we're doing more and more work that way. We're not there yet. Um, and to keep from repeating a lot of what Amy said, there's a lot of curriculum work already being done. Um, we've had an, a really good partnership on phonemic awareness, and part of this is in preparation for some of the, the structured literacy pieces we see coming, which ties to the dyslexia task force and some of the work that's being done there. Um, preschool, she mentioned a lot already, and so I won't rehash that. The other piece that's going on behind the scenes is our work as an uh, administrative team with TASN and really reviewing our MTSS processes. And probably the next piece for our special ed team will be to sit down with Amy and our title staff. And what we're doing specifically is looking at those areas of reading that she mentioned earlier. And we have a, a wealth of intervention materials. And what's happening right now is we have so much available to us that really staying with a real systematic approach is hard in our buildings. And so what we're trying to do is narrow down um, with the help of our teachers, the two or three interventions that we have in each of those areas that have, have the most evidence base to them and have really been shown to be effective so that we can provide more professional development and really ensure that our teachers know this is really where we wanna start and the materials we want, we wanna use first and kind of the progression that we want to lay out um, for them to progress through and hoping that it takes some of the guesswork out of, our teach, out of our special education teachers and really will help them to know if a kid is, is struggling with fluency, this is where I'm starting. If they're struggling with phonemic awareness, this is where I'm going. Um, and, and so we're making some progress there. Um, Boys Town, we've seen a shift this year with our consultants and our trainers coming on board that we're really seeing um, 
the focus of that work is not as much on our special ed department, uh, which has been a huge relief on my side. It's not that we don't still have a role, but we're really seeing our consultants in the buildings driving a lot of that work. Uh, they're obviously collecting data. They're working with Denise Pratt from Boys Town to analyze that data. And they've gone back now and provided professional development. And what that will allow our team to do is to really step back and look at the tier two and tier three components of that um, and make sure our special ed staff are prepared for when a student is still struggling in the classroom with those supports, what do we do next? What does that look like? How do we use the tier two card system more effectively that we have? When do we make a referral to our Engage um, program? All of those pieces. Denise, when she was in the last time, also sat down with Ivy Briggs at Engage, and they, they've done some work um, kind of relooking at the card system that's there and making some adjustments to the motivation system. Um, and so that having that consultant in once a month this year has been a huge help and something that I know was a big commitment from our board uh, last spring, uh, but we're really seeing it pay off uh, in, in results. The other piece I didn't mention connected to that is the role our social workers are playing. Um, at the elementary level right now, they're providing social skills groups. They're playing a big part. When I get to talking about homeless and McKinney Vento, they're playing a big part there. Um, they've taken our Sabres data uh, that we use to screen all of our elementary students and they've taken it back <coughs> to our Boys Town skills. And so they're starting to take some small groups and one-on-one -on -one, um, focusing specifically on skills that either teachers or the student themselves had identified as an area of deficit. And so we're, we're seeing what we wanted to see at this point. We're seeing a real systematic approach to um, behavior um, because all of the different assist systems, whether it's classroom teachers or whether it's our, our special ed programs, we're all working in the same direction, which is what, what we really wanted to see. Um, one of the, a couple of the things that are coming, uh, we are starting this month to put to get together a specialized task force with representation from multiple buildings and multiple programs. Uh, we are seeing right now that our life skills program that's been housed at Lincoln for years um, is looking at the highest student population it, it's had. And what's really happening is becoming kind of a catch-all for a lot of different things. We're seeing students that would, in other districts, fall into a medical fragile program, some that would fall in an autism program, um, some that would fall in your true intellectual disability functional classroom. And what we're finding out is it's really hard for um, staff in that program to, um, to plan and provide instruction to a whole wide variety of students. And the other piece is we probably, based on the criteria we have, we probably have another six to eight students when we look at next year, either coming out of preschool or currently in our program <coughs> that would qualify. So what we're wanting to do is step back over the next couple months and really look at the data based on the students that we have and identify what's our greatest needs. And then also to do some research in surrounding districts, looking at programs that are out there and looking at everything from their functional classrooms, their communication classrooms that would serve their students with autism, um, their behavior classrooms. And let's put together a multi-year plan as to where do we go with our programming? Um, what do we, you know, do we need to scale back what we're doing and rewrite criteria for the programs we do have? Um, what do we do to provide the best services for all students is really what we're looking for. Uh, so our hope would be uh, we put kind of an aggressive timeline. We'll see if we make it or not. We're shooting kind of for March 1st to make some decisions and to have a timeline together, or at least a rough timeline. Um, we'll see where that goes. I don't know that we'll get all the research done that we want to by that point. And part of shooting for somewhere in early March is depending on changes we make, uh, we know it impacts students for even next school year. And so we want to, to try to give as much time to our teams if there's changes that they need to address with families, that they have some time to do that. I didn't put much in the way of early childhood up here, but it's an area that we could talk about in a whole session on its own. Um, we're seeing questions from the state that may drive our work. Um, there were questions today in a survey from the state about class size and what's appropriate and what ratios they might look at. I anticipate we're going to see some changes in our four-year-old at risk requirements for next school year. Um, we'll watch and see what that looks like. Amy mentioned a lot of the curriculum work that's going on. We've had a, an effective curriculum resource. The problem we have is when it was purchased 
five or six years ago. It never really went through a full curriculum process. It never had the opportunity for good professional development. Um, and so we did some of that this fall and our, our staff has gone back and really embraced what the trainer brought in. They've changed their programs, they've changed their schedules. Um, when we went through the redesign process, our team that did that, they outlined an experiential program. Um, originally they were calling it Montessori and when we really started breaking down the criteria that they were looking for, it was more of a Reggio Emilia type program, which I know won't mean much to the rest of you all. Um, but when we really break down what our curriculum that we currently have was designed, that's exactly what it was designed to do. We've just been using it uh, in a different way. And so we've seen a real change there. Um, I think based on the feedback we're currently getting from them, they would like to extend out our curriculum process and continue to, to work with the program we have. Uh, but we'll continue to follow the processes that Amy has put in place. We're seeing some good things there. And it's the scope and sequence being developed will really help um, us kind of drive where we're going. But all of that, we get two years of students before they enter kindergarten, and we want to make sure we're taking as much advantage of that time as we can. Um, we've done more work with data and looking at our outcomes data that we collect for special education, and there's some areas that we, we see we need to make some improvements. And so all of this process fits well together to really uh, hopefully get us moving in a, in a better direction. The other area as far as special ed is concerned on the opposite spectrum that I noticed weren't on my slides is the gifted side. And probably the biggest thing we're doing there is utilizing the COGAT. Uh, the COGAT is designed by the same company that made the old Iowa Test of Basic Skills. Um, we are using it over the next couple months to screen at the elementary level. And this is something we've talked about for a while, um, but that's our first kind of step into it. So we're starting small. But we've used map data from last spring and this fall and identified students that were scoring in the upper end of uh, map and reading and math. And we're, we're putting out over the next couple weeks, they've been going through the SIT process and discussing them with um, school teams to make sure we don't have someone who um, either parents have already said, hey, we're not interested in gifted at all and we don't wanna offend them by bringing it up again, or that we know there's some other factor to to kind of how their testing went and then it may not be appropriate. Um, but we will start contacting parents about a, a voluntary screening process that we will give students who scored high um, the COGAT as a screener and we'll use that hopefully to take some of that pressure off of teachers to recommend students for gifted, um, but to help us in um, at, at second and third grade really starting to identify students who um, the potential's there and depending on where they score it, it will help us in determining whether we need to provide additional intervention even before um, we assess or whether we go right into the evaluation process. So um, we're, we're kind of building the airplane as it flies right now. And um, Becca and Shannon have done a great job of kind of working together with our school psychologist team to put a lot of those pieces in place. And so hopefully uh, we'll we'll find a process here as we go that will help us in identifying more students for our gifted program because that's an area that we're still under identifying um, students as a whole. Before I transition to another program, and I promise the rest of them won't take this long, but special ed's a big piece of what, we're, what I'm responsible for and so I wanted to make sure I hit a lot of those areas. But do you have questions? Okay. Um, my clicker's gone, gone down. Um, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I did highlight here, I guess, before I moved on, I mentioned that we've been shifting our focus to uh, more the instructional side. These are the indicators that the state uh, collects from us, and we should be proud of the work our staff has done. We continue uh, to meet all the requirements set by the state of Kansas uh, f as far as the different outcomes, but I thought I'd just highlight. And I couldn't tell you why there's not an indicator four or nine or 10. It's not because we're not meeting those. It's because they don't collect that data anymore. So um, homeless has been another area that kind of, uh, it, that's taken a little bit more time than expected, but we're making some good strides here. Um, it's with the addition of our social workers, all of our students fill out an enrollment uh, residential form that kind of tells us where they, they live. 
Um, our social workers have taken a big role at the beginning of the year of making contact with all of those families that marked any kind of different housing. And I know in our community there's a lot of conversation right now around our homeless population. Um, and so I'd just share a couple of things. One, uh, when you look at last year's data, and we're on track to being about in that same range again, we had 102 students who met criteria of, of being homeless. Um, most of those in ours are doubled up. Um, so there are families that, um, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about this, most of these families, you're talking about families with jobs, sometimes you're talking both parents with clear jobs, just the cost of living has got to the point where for one reason or another, it's made sense for them um, to not have their own housing um, or you know, paying for childcare and everything else that comes along with, with just the cost of living right now has made it challenging for them to do that. Uh, we don't see, when you compare us to a Wichita or a KCK, we don't see as many families who are completely without housing. We do have a few that will live in, um, in motels. We'll occasionally see some camping at Pomona Lake, um, but the majority of our students are, are doubled up. Um, this last year, that put us at 16th in the state. Uh, we're one of eight school districts right now that still qualify or have received a McKinney-Vento grant. And I will tell you, working with some of the ladies on that team, uh, they are phenomenal at what they do and has really helped me in kind of upping, uh, increasing what we're providing to our students and families that are homeless. Um, Sally and I just got back from Washington, D.C., attending the National Homeless uh, our Educating Homeless Children and Youth Conference, and one of the big takeaways we have is we're exploring a program that got its start in Kansas City, Kansas School District, um, and understand, I think they're looking at like 2,700 students that are, are homeless in their district and a real different homeless population, but they have put together what they call Impact KCK, and it's something we're going to explore. Um, it's more of a, a way to connect families in a more sustainable way with resources, and it would move us from what we're currently doing is patching problems as they come up to a system where we would work more collaboratively with others in our community uh, with the, the sole intent of reducing that, that homeless population. Uh, they've created a model with UMKC that uh, utilizes social workers uh, and community resources in a real different way. And it's something as we get more information, we'll continue to share with the board but we believe it's something we could use more on a preventative, as a preventative model for our system um, to hopefully move some of those families from being at risk of becoming homeless um, to moving them out of the poverty situation they're in and helping connect them to better resources. So it'll be something we'll come back and share with the board at a later time. Um, I won't hit on, on a lot on the qualifications here, especially since I put the wrong one under English learners as actually the migrant qualifications, which is another program we won't even talk about tonight. Um, but I'd highlight a couple things with these. These, our English learner program is one of our fastest growing programs in our district right now, uh, especially in intensity. We're seeing more students move to our community uh, who this is their first school experience in the United States and who speak uh, very little English when they come to us. Uh, and especially this year, we saw, we've seen um, a student from Honduras, we had a family today enroll from India, um, all at our high school, and, and I can't be prouder about the work that our high school staff has done in embracing those students and making sure supports are in place. Um, we've seen, I mean, Garfield right now I think is up to 10 or 11 students who uh, meet criteria for an English learner program, so we're back to discussing whether, uh, whether we would benefit from having a school as a site at the elementary level. Um, it is a program that creates its own challenges because we're seeing more students than resources that we receive from the state to be able to manage the program. Um, and Mrs. Christian and her staff do a great job right now of making sure our students are getting what they need. But as that population grows and the need increases, um, it's gonna create some challenges for us in just being able to meet their needs. Uh, we have transitioned our curriculum and our assessment over the last year and a half to an assessment for identification of the program that we can use every year to kind of monitor progress. Uh, it also matches directly to the curriculum we have. So when a student takes the assessment, it helps our, our teacher in Paris to know this is where to start and this is what to do with them. Um, 
And so we're, we're seeing some gains. I would hope we would see some of those students that have been with us a year or two uh, since we started that, that maybe this spring as we take it, they'll continue to, to not qualify for the program anymore, which would be fantastic. Um, some of the other areas, 504s we're intending in January to provide some in-house training for our staff. This is something we did about two years ago and it's a necessary thing to come back to. And we're gonna try to differentiate it a little bit more based on the experiences our, our staff have in writing and managing those. Um, it's one of those areas where a lot of times as we hire staff, they have very little experience writing a 504. And so the only training they're getting is is what we provide and so we're going to try to make it an annual thing uh, but we'll pick that up in january foster care the state's using a new system that we're learning um, it does give us a little bit more notification when a student is moving um, it's not great sometimes they've already gone before we get the notification uh, which isn't helpful but we're working through some of those things and this is an area where we're seeing a big transition in our community what was kvc is now being split into two different organizations to manage that piece. Um, TFI, who was year, here probably 10 years ago, um, providing those services, and Cornerstones of Care will be starting up um, next year, picking up uh, kind of the family preservation services that KVC all had on one um, umbrella. So we're, we're learning new staff, new processes, who to contact, all of those kind of things all at the same time. Um, so, Lots going on in our specialized programs, but is there anything that you would like me to speak more to or you, or you have questions about? Mr. Robinson, before you go, if there are no questions, one of the things that I did want to address with our board, Mr. Robinson talked about an abundance of materials that we have and trying to uh, understand how we utilize those and create some um, expectation in terms of, of primary, secondary, tertiary resources, so on and so forth. One of the things to remember as a board is that um, a situation we were trying to overcome is that in the past, <laughs> SPED resources were SPED resources, title resources were title resources, and classroom resources were classroom resources. And many times those resources were not shared, even if they happened to be the best resources to provide for our kids. So between Josh and Amy and I, and certainly all of our administrators are beginning to overcome some of those barriers that good resources are good resources. And regardless of whether they purchase with special ed funds, title dollars, whatever it happens to be, if that is the intervention that we need to be providing across the board, that'll be the intervention that we use for all of our students. But it is a change in the processes that we've used from the past. And we're finding a lot of those resources were designed to be used in multiple settings, even to be able to be taught more than one time using the same resources in the same day. Um, in a lot of cases, what happens in special ed is it's more the intensity that we narrow <coughs> groups, you get more practice. So uh, we're trying to overcome some of those things that we have to have a resource that's just ours. Um, really what we want is to make sure that what we're doing supports what classroom teachers are doing and make sure that ultimately the kid is learning and making progress. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. yes, that's yes, a good thing. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a great amount of very good information. Um, board reports. Yeah, I just have three quick yes. things. Uh, first of all, to Harold, <coughs> Julie, and um, Susan there, congratulations on being reelected to the school board. And to uh, Melidia, congratulations on your first term starting in January. So. I uh, got a lot to learn on, in that first year, so, um, but it'll be an experience that you'll truly enjoy. So, second, um, I know in this district we have a lot of employees that have served our great country, and today being Veterans Day, I want to say thank you to those in our district who have served or are currently serving. Um, it takes a lot to do what they do. Um, and thirdly, on that note, um, I don't know if any of you have ever attended the Middle School Veterans Day celebration, but my goodness, um, what, a, what a neat uh, experience, especially the end when all the entire student body of the middle school walks out of that commons area dead silent. I never knew that you can get middle school kids to be that quiet. <laughs> um, but uh, Mr. Circle uh, did a great job of putting that together, and, and I thank the district and the uh, 
and the staff and the admin there at the middle school for putting that on every year. It's a neat thing to experience. And Brian, thank you for your service as well. I know that's a hat that you wear amongst all the other hats that you uh, wear and service to. I like hats. Well, so forth. A lot of hats, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, moving on, section 6.01, Mr. Graff is gonna discuss with us uh, the expansion of wrestling to include a girls team and the possibility of an addition of a bowling team at OHS. I brought reinforcements with me tonight. Um, wrestling coach Dalton Wydell is here to answer any questions that may be more technical than I can answer. Um, last spring, Keisha um, added girls wrestling as a sanctioned high school sport in the state of Kansas. Um, for probably the last four or five years, they've had a girls state tournament, but it was a tournament that you didn't have to qualify for. Girls could wrestle, they could wrestle boys, they could wrestle girls. Um, they could qualify as a boys to, to compete at boys rest regional as well as a boys state tournament, but then there was also a girls tournament. Um, the state has, is considering two options that a school can do. Number one, Ottawa High School has, has had a mixed wrestling team for as long as I can remember. I've been here 13 years and we've always had at least one or two um, girls that were out for wrestling. It was considered a mix, mixed team. Those girls could wrestle girls if the girls were available. They could also wrestle boys. And then in postseason, they had the opportunity to compete with boys in regional and then state if they qualified. That option is still in place. But if we have a mixed wrestling team, girls could only be eligible to wrestle boys in postseason. The second option is adding a girls wrestling team. Doing so will allow girls to compete against girls throughout the season. If Ottawa High School went to a dual format, uh, we duel uh, both Lewisburg and Paola. If they have girls in a weight class that we have girls, those girls will wrestle each other. If they have no girls in a weight class we're in, our girls can wrestle boys, but that's an exemption for just two years. Um, if we have a girls wrestling team, at the end of the year, the girls would have a girls regional tournament with the opportunity to, to advance to a girls' state tournament, correct? Correct. Okay. If a girl is on a mixed team, she can only wrestle boys, and she forgoes the opportunity to wrestle against girls, as long as the team is mixed. So in order to provide an equitable and competitive, I guess, fairness or opportunity, adding a girls wrestling team would be beneficial to those young ladies. The way it works right now, we have two coaches on staff, Coach Wydell and uh, Casey Black, Mr. Black. Dalton has assured me that from a practice situation, that wouldn't necessarily be a conflict. We had a meeting last week and there were five girls in attendance mm -hmm. and we've had six girls in attendance and we have had contact from a couple other girls that may have expressed interest as well. So we may be anywhere between five and eight girls that would be wrestling. Um, from a workout standpoint, Coach Wydell has assured me that the coaches could manage that situation. Where we end up in a little bit of a difficult spot is if I have reached out to the schools that we're competing against in tournaments. Some of those schools are going to add girls divisions in their wrestling tournaments, so we would have girls opportunities at those events where our coaches would be. In the past, with a mixed team, and I will bring Justine Kennington's name up, she was a, a young lady that competed for the last three years at the state tournament and did quite well. When we had Justine off at the state tournament, it was the same weekend as our league tournament, yep. so that split our two coaches. Mr. Wydell stayed with our boys. Casey Black and his wife Beth Black went off to the girls tournament so Justine can compete at McPherson. So as long as we're in the same place, we'll be fine. We go to Wamigo and they run four mats and we have two boys coaches off because we have boys wrestling at the same time in different places in the same gym. It can create a bit of a difficult spot if we are splitting our coaches, not only in the same venue, but in different locations. So there could be a possible issue with number of coaches or support staff to make sure we're getting adequate coverage. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about how you're going to manage practices? 
Yeah, I can. <laughs> so I've kind of just, uh, based on the number of girls we have, uh, talked to them a little bit. And obviously for the first couple of weeks, even with advanced wrestlers and boys, we're all going to kind of practice together so we can start from the beginning, teach the basics and stuff like that. I'm planning on, after Thanksgiving break, kind of splitting practices. So my, var my varsity or whoever qualifies as the more advanced will probably start off the first hour in the weight room or something like that while I'm working with the girls in the JV or something like that. That way we don't have a bunch of numbers in there. And then they'll rotate or switch. Or <clears throat> I know I have right now three days a week or my varsity guys are going to come in the mornings and we're going to practice in the mornings. And the evenings we'll all practice together or we'll split again with the weight room and stuff like that. That way is everything's not cramped and I can focus on more of who I need to and not be in eight different places at once. That's kind of how I have practices split as of right now. Um, is there any other questions with girls wrestling or anything I can answer? I, I, have a, go ahead. I believe if we had a girls wrestling team, it puts us with one girls program more than boys programs. Does that impact Title IX laws in any way, shape, or form? I don't. I don't think it does. I think where it could impact Title IX <coughs> is when we start talking about what coaches we're sending to different places. Okay. Uh, are we just sending a body to be there? Or are we sending somebody that's knowledgeable in the wrestling area? Okay. Um, right now, we have six sports in the fall. We have six sports in the spring. And we have three sports in um, the winter. So if we would add girls wrestling, it would get us to four. So. I think our numbers are really pretty consistent. I mean, there's nothing, there's football, um, and there's no like sport at, during that yeah. season, but we do have, you know, boys golf and girls golf, boys tennis, girls tennis, uh, tracks a consolidated sport. So I think I think we would be fine. Um, I don't anticipate that would be a problem. The problem would be if we just start sending just anybody, somebody anybody. Just, to, just to be there as a body. Yeah. Um, I've kind of broken down a little bit what those costs might be. Uh, there is a $110 sanction fee, um, and we pay those sanction fees out of the athletic budget at the high school. We get that money from gate receipts and entry fees and those types of things. Um, <coughs> uniforms, uh, about two or three years ago, uh, NFHS, National Federation of High School Athletics, um, modified the wrestling uniform. You know, you have the attractive singlet, the always popular singlet, um, and now they've modified it to where they can wear a two-piece uniform, which is basically fight-type boxing shorts and then a spandex or uh, compression shirt, um, and that could be standard uniform for girls as well. Uh, some girls you'll see in singlets with a t-shirt underneath or, or a uh, compression shirt underneath. Um, and then, depending on transportation, uh, we just got an email today from Eudora. Our varsity, our varsity goes to the Eudora tournament. Eudora is adding a girls' division. A number of tournaments that we do attend will have girls' divisions. We had a girls' division in our tournament last year here in, in Ottawa, and we plan to do that again this coming season as well. So it just, I think it's the best option to add a girls' program because it gives them the opportunity at the end of the season to compete with girls. Um, and in two years, the option to be a mixed team is going to go away anyway. And I think our numbers on the boys' side last year, we were right around 25 kids to, to make it through the season. And if we're adding five or six girls, um, it would be nice to get more girls involved. Uh, then they can compete against each other in practice. So I, I think numbers would be manageable uh, on a day-to-day -day basis just when we get into tournaments and those types of things. What does OU have for girls wrestling? How many do they have out? They have a full team? Uh, yeah, they have a full team. I think they last I checked, they had about 30, 25 to 30 girls. I would say there's a lot of interest growing in girls wrestling. Um, I know I've seen and heard of several girls that don't go to this district that are competing at state in uh, wrestling. So. I don't know how many of our neighboring schools have. Do they any of them have um, interest? You know, I have that information. I think it's on a sticky note on my desk. Okay. Um, I think Spring Hill is double double digits, uh, 13 to 15 kids. Is uh, that correct? They have about 30. Oh, I guess I was wrong. Yeah. Uh, Bal Baldwin, Baldwin has like 10. Yeah. Um, I talked to. 
Piper, I think, has one girl. Tonganoxy is less than five. Um, Paola had their meeting, and they had four girls that showed. Um, I think Eudora had five. E Eudora's four or five. So our numbers are somewhat consistent with the bulk of the Frontier League. Um, McPherson has 30-some. Yeah. They were kind of the, the, the cradle of where girls wrestling in the state of Kansas started. Um, so I think from a Frontier League standpoint, our numbers are consistent with the majority mm -hmm. of, of the members. Um, but it does give our girls an opportunity. Um. There, there's 12 states that have uh, girls wrestling as like a sport. And uh, seven of them are just added in the last year. And there's actually 40 uh, colleges that have girls wrestling. Or no, 50 as of right now. Uh, five at the JUCO level, 25 in AI, uh, 10 D3, and 9 D2, and 1 at D1 level. So it's growing everywhere. And they say it's the fastest growing sport in the Midwest. Was it last year that there was a first like high school championship or state deal for girls wrestling, or is that going to be this year? It'll be this year. It'll be this year. This'll, this is the first year that girls wrestling is a sanctioned Keisha uh, member sport. Uh, they've had a state tournament at McPherson, I think, the last three or four years, uh, but it was not sanctioned. an official sanctioned tournament. And you mentioned Ottawa University. Um, Ottawa University recruits quite well for all of their programs, um, and if we were to establish a girls' wrestling program, it would give our girls an opportunity. Yeah, and that's why I was asking. To, we to have them right there. here as a benefit in our community, and yeah, I was just curious where their numbers were. Sure. sure. We had a girls' golf, and they did great. I think we ought to do this. Huh? We, we had 13 girls golfers, um, and two of them qualified for state, exactly. and every one of those girls will be back next year. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no seniors in the t on the team, so it did provide yeah. an opportunity for girls to get involved, and this is another opportunity as well. Yeah. Anything we can do to keep kids involved and active and hooked into school is a great thing, I think. I don't disagree. Do you foresee, like, eventually we'll get into, like, a league title on something like that, we start getting enough girls across the board? Uh, um, that's... I think the Frontier League, we've got nine schools, so I think we have to have not five schools that have a sanctioned team in any sport. Right now, there's not enough girls to have a girls golf league champion. Uh, I just say it's growing, so I, yeah. I, bet, it, I yeah. bet you will be there before long. Yeah, and I, I don't know what that number would be from an individual school standpoint. Mm -hmm. There are 13 weight classes, 13 yes. or 14 there's weight classes. So to compete for a league title, you would have to have full weight classes to yeah. have that opportunity. Uh, but I would anticipate down the road that that would be a consideration as long as schools keep adding girls' teams and not be mixed programs. Yeah, you I just think it's nice to see girls, stuff like this growing and absolutely. gaining traction. Absolutely. So the last one was heavyweight? So no, the last 13 because oh. they don't have heavyweight in girls. Oh, division. good. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to call a girl heavyweight. <laughs> That's bad. All the way Mr. Really Graff, awesome. whenever you had the meeting with the girls and the parents, were the parents on board also with having the girls? We, I'll be honest <coughs> with you, we did not meet with parents. Oh, we just met with, with okay. the young ladies. We had an, uh, an all call and, and just said any girl interested. We'd sent an email out, I think, a couple days prior to, and we made announcements for about two or three days leading up to okay. that meeting, and um, we had a number of girls that showed up. Okay. Thank you. And we're excited about it. Now, I think the bottom line for me is that if, there, we, if we have interest in a program, then we need to do everything we can to provide for that program. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, there's more experience gained out of that program for those students than just being a student. Um, so I think this is great. Um, I, I think we should definitely move forward with it um, whenever we decide to as a board. So. I, I think it should be on the agenda, uh, or we can put it on the agenda at our next meeting to go ahead and make a formal vote on that. But it sounds like we have we have good support here uh, for the program, and thank you for sharing that. And then, then you also have some information on bowling. For I have some. I have some information. Thank you, Mr. Waddell. Thank you. Thank you. I have some information about um, bowling. Um, we have been contacted by a couple different <coughs> students. Uh, there hasn't been an overwhelming. Um, I guess show of support, although I anticipate that that's going to happen uh, following up with this discussion. Um, right now, there are 81 schools in the state of Kansas that have bowling. Uh, and that's roughly 1,800 students, boys and girls, in the state of Kansas. On our side of the state, in the Frontier League, there is only one school. Uh, Piper and Bonner Springs are a co-op together. 
Um, all of the schools in United Kansas Conference, uh, DeSoto, the former Frontier League school, Turner, Baser, Linwood, uh, Shawnee Heights, Lansing, uh, all have bowling programs. Uh, all of the schools in the, um, the uh, what's the, the, the league that Hayden's in, all the Topeka schools all have bowling. So there are teams, uh, the Sunflower League, the Lawrence schools, Olathe schools, the Blue Valley schools, and EKL, all those schools have it. So there are a number of schools. There's 41 schools in from Topeka East that have bowling. There are 40 west of Topeka that have bowling. So the opportunity to get in bowling tournaments would be plentiful for us. I looked at the schedules today. Um, Mrs. Whitaker has called Fusion Lane to talk about the opportunities to get out and practice, and they have said those opportunities are there. Um, most of the schools that participate in bowling have a, a joint relationship with the bowling alley that if they host a tournament or an event, entry fees or admission from patrons coming in, go back to the bowling alley. Uh, we have not talked finances with Fusion as to what that would be or how that would work. Um, the bowling season would start January 1st and goes through March 6th, which is an eight-week season, which it coincides with, with cross country, with volleyball, uh, basically with every sport that we have. Um, regionals would be the first week of March. Students can participate in 10 competitions. Um, I think it's something that, that we need to consider in the future. Uh, I think it's a might be a little bit late to add something this year to get it really moving and maybe look at something like this for the 2021 school year. Uh, make sure we have all of our ducks in a row before we move forward on it. But I anticipate that uh, I know the partnership we have with Great Life from both Boys and Girls Golf is beneficial not only to our students but also to Great Life and the business community. And I can see that being a, a, a boost or a, a very positive relationship with, with Fusion as well. So I would, I would like to move forward on having conversations with our students to see exactly where we are, um, to see if that's something we'd like to add as well. Uh, bowling team consists of six bowlers um, on the varsity, six bowlers on the JV, uh, both boys and girls. So we could be looking at, it, depending on the numbers, we could be looking at additional 24 students uh, that you know, aren't basketball players, aren't wrestlers, uh, because it, does, it is a winter sport. Any questions? Anyone? Yeah. Thank you very much for giving us that information, Mr. Gray. Thank you. All right, 6.02, the 2021 calendar. All right, again, this will come off of me if you click on the old calendar. This uh, comes back from the uh, board handbook. Uh, it was mentioned that the board would like to see kind of a rough draft of the calendar prior to us putting it out to um, staff. So here it is. As you can see, there are a couple of things that, uh, that we wanted to draw attention to. One, um, you will notice that we start and all the colors didn't show up on this, which is not, not great. Um, so we actually start August 7th with an in-service day. The 7th, 10th um, <coughs> are both in-service days. 11th is a work day. The 12th is an in-service day. The 13th is a half day. The 14th would be your first full day with students. Um, so you saw that first day coming back into, um, into school as one of the additional days that we added to this calendar. Um, through the negotiations process. The other thing you'll see, Dean, as you, as you scroll down there, um, you'll see that that end service day, so you have the end of the quarter uh, that takes place on the 16th. Um, so that is your work day for the end of the quarter. Parent-teacher conferences exist that week of the 19th through the 23rd in October. Uh, and then you're off on that Friday for uh, parent-teacher conferences and the additional contract day uh, from working in the evenings during that. You will see one of the changes again, one of the things that the board said was when we had those two PD days back to back, we'd like to make one of those back to a student contact day. Uh, so you see one of those PD days come off of there uh, and only the one PD day that exists there on in-service uh, on, on October 30th. 
Um, if you continue to scroll down, November looks basically the same. You see where Thanksgiving rolls in there. And then you see the change uh, again in December. You go all the way through December 18th. The 21st is the flex day, um, which is currently the way that the, the calendar works. Uh, but that flex day is in essence the work day for the end of the, of the second quarter. If you go back up to January, you'll, you'll recognize that um, we still come back to a PD day on the 4th, which is kind of the way that it's been over the course of the last few years. Maybe the big conversation is what takes place in March over spring break. Um, so currently spring break is identified as the 15th through the 19th. This will, this will continue to be the conversation that, that exists as long as the region schools continue to be split on their, on their spring break weeks. KU and K-State are the week of the 8th through the 12th. Every other region school is the week of the 22nd through the 26th. Either way you look at it, there are going to be a group of parents who are not happy about where our spring break falls with their student spring breaks in the region schools, not to mention where any of the other universities across the state of Kansas fall within their, within their spring break. The reason that we have it listed as the 15th through the 19th is that the same as last year when we had a similar conversation with our staff. The 15th through the 19th falls in the exact 10th week of the semester. So you can finish the nine weeks and move, uh, move into, so you actually finish the nine weeks at, um, at, that, at the 5th. You have the opportunity for um, conferences the 8th through the 11th and after conferences you can move right into spring break this is kind of the way that we have done it if you move it forward you push your conferences back if you move it backwards you got a whole you got a whole nother week before spring break and we all know that it gets a little hectic at that point in time so currently we have spring break in the same week that we would have it in this particular calendar April falls out as it normally does you have good Friday off and then your your um, your additional Friday um, early release days. The other aspect of this is that um, the 14th is listed there as an early release day. Um, it would be your last day of school um, for all staff members or for all students. It is again the extra day that we that we worked in through negotiations and then the 17th would be your work day for teachers coming back. So you finish with, stu uh, with students on a Friday, you have the weekend off, your work day comes back on the following Monday. Um, when we talked to, to our negotiators about how we wanted those days split, they wanted one at the beginning of the year, one at the end of the year, not prior to um, a release from uh, before winter break or return <coughs> back. So this is where it falls out in the calendar. There is still a, a lot of work to do here. We need to, to see how teachers respond to this calendar. Um, we want to get some insight, certainly, on where spring break falls. But again, as our board wanted to look at what we would be releasing to them, this would be the first draft of the calendar for the 2020-21 school year. Any questions on the calendar? You will see that you see an increase in teacher contract days from 179 to 181. You see an increase in student days from 163 and a half to 167 and a half. So four additional days in terms of student contact time. Two of those are because we negotiated in two days. The other two are because we took out two uh, PD days that had been added in uh, prior to the adoption of the Fountas and Pinnell classroom for multiple days of training that uh, we ought to be able to move past now. Okay, any questions about the calendar? So this gives us three professional development days throughout the year. Yeah, in addition to the four and, at the beginning yeah, of the year. And we, and we yes. have the, the yeah. early release as days. As well so as that, every Friday. Yeah, right. Yep. Any questions for Dr. Cobbs? There oh, is nothing more frustrating intense. than the calendar. Oh, I know. And so it takes Ooh. a lot of work. So this is not one of those things that we take lightly, of course, but we, you know, we appreciate what work you've done for I us so far. I think there's one thing that we, I mean, we've had a different calendar every year for the last seven years. This one becomes as close to, um, consistent with our last calendar as we have seen we've either changed from early release Wednesdays to late starts and late starts to back to early releases to 
this and that. We've had lots of different calendars. This one remains consistent with Friday PLC days. It remains consistent with the vast majority of our, of our PD days. It remains consistent with the start times throughout the year, the addition of a day at the beginning and at the end. Other than that, the calendar remains very consistent. It's consistent in spring break. And hopefully we can build upon that consistency and, and, and uh, parents appreciate not having drastic changes in their schedules throughout the year. So, okay, no further questions. Good. Thank you. All right, we do not have um, an executive session for personnel tonight, um, but you all have been presented with the personnel report. Is there a motion to approve the personnel report? So moved. moved. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Um, do we have Harold with yep. us? Okay, so we have yes. So we have seven O on that. And we are down to announcements. All right, just a couple of things. Uh, we start uh, some concert seasons. The uh, OHS Fall Jazz Concert. We were kind of hoping we could get in the PAC, but we haven't been through enough trainings yet to know how it works. Um, so we will, we will have that one, I believe, in the Cyclone Room. Um, then we have fourth grade music programs coming up this week, both at Lincoln and Sunflower um, on, I think, Thursday. Is that right, Thursday? Yep. Um, we have Tazin coming in. Josh and Amy both talked about our work with Tazin from a curriculum uh, standpoint as well as from an intervention standpoint. They meet with all of our administrators on the 19th. The big thing, I think, for all of us is ribbon cutting for the PAC uh, is on the 22nd. We'll start at 2.30 p.m. Um, give our students the opportunity. There'll be uh, a theatrical performance, a choir performance, and a band performance in the pack to, to open its doors and, and welcome everybody in. We will also directly after that have a, a streaming of the, um, of the Carnegie uh, performance uh, from our choir students uh, while they were in New York. Um, so you can come in and sit in the pack one listen to the incredible sound system that exists there But also watch an incredible performance of our students at Carnegie Hall um, Then we have redesigned check-in on the 26th and of course Thanksgiving break right around the corner at 27 and, and 29th of November So those are our announcements coming in All right. Well at this time is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor raise your right hand we got 7-0 on that. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I am shocked that you all three made it through the entire night. Thank you so much for being here. That's Mrs. Steinbaugh, great. thank you. Parents, thank you so much for being here tonight. Appreciate you very much.